Mm -hmm. so. You know, I don't know if it, Gordon was dabbled in lots of civic stuff, and he said once, it's too bad I have to earn a living because <laughs> I love doing this other, you know, the, the, the community things. And well, I find that to be the same thing because you kind of flip around once in life, and uh, mm -hmm. if you're going to make some sort of difference, uh, that's what I mean. uh -huh. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. Well, it was double. Uh, I don't know if we did the practice, but I was the managing partner of the law firm, and that was almost harder than practicing law. And uh, this could, you know, if I had a meeting at four, I could get up and leave and uh, go into another world. Sure. You destined to be a lawyer? Was this was this your career calling from the beginning? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, uh, maybe not from the very, very beginning, but from the ninth grade. Mm -hmm. uh, I was uh, uh, in the ninth grade. We had junior high schools in Loyola in those days, and you went from uh, uh, six through nine in, in uh, uh, the uh, junior high. Anyway, I was in the ninth grade, getting ready to go to high school, and uh, I had a teacher uh, who uh, taught social studies. Mm -hmm. And one of her planned activities was to have a trial, a mock trial. And uh, so she, or whoever I guess she chose the players, and she chose me as the district attorney in this criminal case to prosecute this case. And uh, so we studied our scripts, and anyway, we had the trial, and it was a, for the junior high, it was a big success. And I loved every minute of it. I had always loved history and government, even younger than that, but uh, from that time forward, not that very day, but that just cemented the fact. And it was very interesting you, uh, on that question because when I was in the service, both in World War II and the Korean War, but particularly in World War II, I was only uh, joined when I was 17, and uh, there were a lot of uh, young uh, fellows, of course, that. Uh, you got to know all over the country. And I would say that uh, fewer than 10% of us, or them, knew what they wanted to do when they got out of the service. And it was so comforting to me <laughs> to know exactly what I wanted to do and what I did do. And at 78, I don't regret it a minute. If I had it all to do over again, I would go the same route. I've enjoyed the law, I've enjoyed what it's done for me, and, and uh, uh, really have no regrets. Where's home? Home is Louisville, Kentucky. That's where you grew up? That's where I was born. As I often say, people say they were born and bred in Kentucky or in Louisville, and I say, well, I was born in Louisville. I know where I was bred. I'm unclear. I, I don't know where that happened. But uh, I, I, my family, I'm, I'm about a fourth or fifth generation Louisville. My family lived there for years. You found your way going to college where? I went to Center College, which is in Danville, Kentucky, whose uh, greatest claim to fame is uh, historically, nationally, that in 1921, Center, which had only 22 people on the team, beat Harvard seven to nothing, uh, and Harvard was the na were the national champions in those days. So, even on the the uh, water tank in Danville, uh, I think it's still there. Uh, maybe faded, but it's still there. It says centers. No, it's six to nothing. I, I said seven. It was six. Center six, Harvard nothing. It's still, <laughs> that's the claim to fame. Bo McMillan was was the star of that team, and center had great football teams back in those days. Uh, when I got there, they did away with scholarships. So now we play uh, in a, a league where no scholarships, and they play for fun with Davidson and Washington and Lee, and, and it's much better, much sure. better. And then from there? From there, <laughs> I went to the University of Louisville. I had a choice. I could uh, uh, have gone to nearly any school I, I wanted to, within reason. I was an only child, and uh, so I could have gone to one of the big schools, or I could get married. 
it was one of the two. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got married. <laughs> so we went, we went to the, uh, uh, we went to the University of Louisville. Jerry didn't go to school, but she, she worked, I worked, worked her way through and, and uh, did pretty well. And then I got a fellowship to Yale to get my master's. Uh, I graduated from law school in 51, went to Yale, got my master's in 52, was called back into the Korean War in the JAG, where I'd gotten a reserve commission uh, and served in the JAG for two and a half years, and then had the great honor and fortunate circumstance of being selected as a law clerk to Justice Reed. Well, let's talk a little bit about that. We, I know we got a little bit into it. Is how, how did that transpire? <laughs> Well, it transpired because I had a professor at Yale by the name of John Frank, who was a very fine professor and also became uh, and was a great lawyer out in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, he, he was very active in the American Law Institute, uh, ABA, and uh, was a wonderful writer, wrote a number of books. He had clerked for Justice Black a number of years before that. And I was in a seminar course at Yale with him, and uh, we became friends and, and with he and his wife. And <clears throat> uh, both, I guess, thought well of each other. But anyway, I got called back in the service. And uh, I had been in, back in the service. I was supposed to serve for three years. And I had served for almost two and a half, or a little over two. And about uh, 11.30 one night, I got a phone call. Uh, we lived on Staten Island and commuted to Governor's Island, which was headquarters of First Army where I was stationed. From, uh, and John said, I apologize for calling so late, but he said, I just got back from a trip and I found a letter and a note call from Stanley Reed who wanted me to recommend a law clerk. And he said, I couldn't think of anybody I'd rather recommend than you. Uh, and this was even after two years. I thought he'd probably forgotten me, but uh, fortunately he hadn't. And he said, would you like for me to turn your name in? So of course he did. I got a call from Reed's office a few weeks later, went to Washington, interviewed, and, uh, uh, and got the job. Uh, as I told you earlier, uh, I think a great deal of it had to do with the fact that my wife was from Ashland, Kentucky, and her family were friends of the Reeds, and uh, particularly her grandfather who had been U.S. Senator from Kentucky. Uh, and the Reeds were great friends in Washington. So I think that helped me considerably. But I'm the only law clerk Reed ever had while he was active for his 19 years. He never had a, another law clerk from Kentucky, which I thought was very odd. And I, and I really uh, thought he, shouldn't have, he should have done more for Kentucky than he did as far as law clerks. But, uh, that's it. Had you been recommend? Had, did you have an interview with Stanley Reed at all? Oh yes, yes, yeah. I, I came from uh, from New York down uh, to Washington for the interview and was interviewed in his chambers in the Supreme Court. And uh, most of the time was taken up by reminiscing about my wife's family <laughs> and uh, Kentucky and uh, uh, what I liked in law school and what I didn't. It, it wasn't a cross-examination or, or an LSAT type test. It was really getting to know you and will I like this boy and will he do what I like for him to do and so apparently I passed muster. Did you know who your co clerk would be? No, not at that time. Uh, I don't think, I think he chose me first and uh, I got, the Army let me out early to take the job, I might say. My uh, commanding officer was, a cur <laughs> was also from Kentucky. <laughs> uh, the Honorable Chester D. Silvers was the uh, Army Staff Judge Advocate. And so I went in to see the Colonel. I told him I'd gotten this appointment. Well, he went, he just loved it. He went out in the office, told everybody, you know, Davidson's going to Supreme, <clears throat> to the Supreme Court. Isn't that wonderful? And I said, well, you know, I have to get out. He, yeah, I'll get you out, don't worry. And he did. So I went to the court in May uh, of, uh, of uh, 1953, 54, 54, 54. I'm going to do is just, I'm going to adjust your mic just a little bit. Coming into the court, uh, you really have no way of knowing what the, 
what is expected of you as a court clerk without referring talking to one of the prior clerks. <laughs> that, that's pretty much the case. Who was your mentor? Uh, Jack Fassett, uh, who, uh, by the way, has written the definitive biography of Stanley Reed called uh, Stanley Reed, The New Deal Justice, which I recommend anybody who's interested in Supreme Court lore and personalities. A marvelous book. Uh, but Jack, uh, each year, uh, in those days, the justices only had two clerks. Now I understand they have four clerks. And the interesting thing, with four clerks, they aren't doing any more work than they did when they had two clerks. Uh, so you can see that the two clerks worked a lot harder than the four clerks did. Uh, maybe not, but I think so. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, one clerk leaves at first, and, and then one stays to break in the new one, and then the new one, the second new one comes so that the first new one can break in the other one. So my co-clerk was a man named Joel, is a man named Joel Kozal who was a second honor graduate, Harvard Law School, been a brilliant lawyer in Boston, has uh, been written up in a number of books. Uh, one of his clients wrote a book, uh, named a chapter, The Greatest Lawyer That Ever Lived. Uh, it was all about Joel Kosal. So, so he was a wonderful guy, as was his wife. So we had a wonderful time, and we were very congenial. And, and Reed was a wonderful guy to clerk for. He, he was very considerate, uh, he was uh, very personable, and uh, his wife was very kind. So uh, it, it was a, just a magnificent year, just wonderful. How did Reed work? Did, did he have you come listen to the oral arguments at all? Uh, only on occasion, right. particularly when he thought he was going to write the opinion uh, or he was very interested in the case. He never objected us going to oral argument any time, as long as we did our other work, uh, which of course we did. Uh, but uh, I went to a lot of oral arguments, more than, I'd say more than, but I don't know that any of the clerks went to more than I did, because I thoroughly enjoyed it. I enjoyed being in the, in the courtroom and listening to that. And I, every time I walked in, I was inspired, it was like going into a cathedral, and it never left me. Uh, one interesting, uh, funny story, uh, sort of funny, uh, was that uh, I had been out of law school since 51, and so this is 55 now, uh, and I mentioned to the justice, I said, you know, I, uh, I've been out of law school long enough to qualify for admission to the, to the Supreme Court. Oh, he said, that's wonderful. He said, you know, most clerks are too young to do that. He said, that's fine. He said, you definitely want to do that. And he said, uh, well, he said, we'll have to plan this, so uh, who, who to have someone introduce you uh, uh, a prominence. And I said, well, I noticed that the vice president has introduced a lot of people who have to be Richard Nixon at the time, mm -hmm. Eisenhower was president. And uh, I said, I thought, you know, uh, we had lunch with him and uh, I kind of knew him vaguely and knew the justice knew him well and he said you don't want the vice president he said you want the solicitor general he said that's the real lawyer he said there's only one real lawyer in government and that's the solicitor general and he said I'll fix that up I'll set that up for you which he did it was Simon E. Soboloff was the, was then the solicitor general but he was adamant on the fact that unless you were in it, he said, you don't want senators or politicians. <laughs> he said, you want a lawyer. Somebody's really got some clout here. And so, uh, so Simon E. Soboloff did. Uh, and they, they, as you may know, uh, they introduce the people by seniority of the, uh, the person introducing them. In other words, if it's the vice president, then, then senators, and and so on down, and then Soboloff is high on the agenda. So they called uh, Justice Warren, said to recognize Solicitor General, and he stood up and he said, Your, Your Honor, I have the pleasure of presenting Gordon B. Davidson of Kentucky, blah, blah, blah. He looked at his credentials and so on. Well, the funny part of this story is that, of course, Jerry was there, my wife, and uh, uh, the funny part of the story is that to the rest of the justices, this is the most boring period of the day. I mean, they, they don't, some 
put, I mean, they put up with it, but they, they really don't like it. So uh, Frankfurter always turned his chair around with his back to where, where, the, where the podium. He, he wanted to show his dis distaste, plus the fact he was always reading something. So when Sobolov uh, said my name, Frankfurter spun around and looked down at me and went, hello. <laughs> That's the only time I ever saw him jolly. <laughs> but that really happened. Jerry saw it. <laughs> well, that's probably a good segue to the personalities of the justices. Mm. You had a chance to be there during that time period. Uh, first and foremost, did you even have a chance? Was Jackson there? Yes. Uh, long enough to yes, get yes. A sense about him? Uh, uh, only uh, vaguely, not nearly as much, obviously, the other justices. He came back uh, in the early spring, as I recall. Uh, well, of course, he came back for the decision in Brown two, as well as Brown one, and uh, so he was there when I got there. Uh, he was coming in, uh, as was his clerk Barrett Prettyman, and uh, so one day uh, I had been there several weeks, I guess, and I wanted to go see Prettyman, who was very helpful to me and is one of the old huh, old guard. And I walked in, and I went in the wrong door. And uh, I knocked, and the voice said, come in. And I opened the door, and there was a chair backed up to me. And with that, it turned around, and it was Justice Jackson. <laughs> and I apologized profusely. And he said, no, no, come in, sit down. So I chatted with him for a few minutes. But that was really as close as I got to know him. Mm -hmm. uh, but I remember the, the horror and shock and and sadness on the day he died. Uh, the whole court was devoted to him. Uh, I would say he was as well liked and as admired as any of the justices. Uh, he's really a favor to most people. And it was a tragic, tragic day. I remember it very well. Did you go to the funeral? I did not. I did not. Uh, I, I, think, I don't recall even why I didn't or why. I, my recollection is I assume Barrett did, uh, but uh, and the justices did, uh, but I, I don't think and many of the law clerks went. Uh, <laughs> probably the justices wanted to stay there and do certs. <laughs> William Douglas. Mm. He was the biggest disappointment of all. Uh, as a law student, uh, both uh, at the University of Louisville Law School, now known, by the way, as Brandeis Law School, because Justice Brandeis was from Louisville and left his books there and is buried under the front porch of the law school. He and his wife both are right under the front porch with two plaques. But at any rate, so it's now Brandeis Law School, but it's University of Louisville. And uh, so, uh, Having been in undergraduate school there, Douglas was, was most of us, was, he was our hero. I mean, most of us were in that, in that day and time, uh, you know, liberal and, and progressive and all this, and he, and the outdoors and climbing mountains and all that stuff, and he was very appealing to all of us. And so I was really, really looking forward to getting to know him, among all others. Well, it was, the disappointment was he was an extremely cold fish uh, to the law clerks. Uh, I don't mean he was nasty. Well, he was to his own, but not to others. But would barely speak to you in the halls. Uh, had little or no time for you uh, in the courthouse, I mean in the uh, court area. Uh, socially, I was with him a couple times at cocktail parties, some of which he gave. <laughs> when he was getting married, uh, second or third time, uh, and then he came to ours. The clerks always had a had a party after the judicial reception at the White House, and he came to that, which was very surprising to us. And he was very warm and very friendly, and and it really a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. But that's the only time I knew uh, that he was fun. He only had one clerk. 
All the rest had two, the chief had three. Uh, but he uh, had only one clerk so he could have an extra secretary, which <laughs> sort of figures, I guess. Yeah. But uh, he was very unkind to his clerk uh, and, and, uh, and almost no intercourse with the clerk except on strictly business. Is that Harvey Grossman? Yeah, 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 I think it was. I felt so sorry for him because he was a nice young man. He was a very retiring, shy sort of fellow, uh, Grossman was. Uh, I think that's his name. Uh, but whoever it was. Uh, and and uh, he, he just got kicked around all the time <laughs> by, Jack, uh, by Douglas. So he was a big disappointment. Uh, we thought he'd be buddy-buddy and, and he was one of the younger members and everybody. But everybody had the same reaction, pretty much. Uh, I don't know anybody that left the court with great regard for Jackson. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, excuse me, for uh, we'll, uh, we'll let it down. For, <laughs> I'm sorry, I, uh, <laughs> for um, no, left with Douglas. They they had great regard for Jackson. <clears throat> Stanley Reed, uh, he had some relationship. Some relationships better, better relationships with certain judges than, than others. Yes, he did, as they all did. Uh, that was nothing unusual, though. But uh, Sherman Minton, uh, of course, was a great friend. Uh, Tom Clark was a great friend, close friend, and I would say his favorite, Reed's favorite, was Burton. Uh, Bur uh, I never will forget. Reed told me on more than one occasion. He said. I don't know that I'll ever get to meet Jesus Christ, but having met Harold Burton is about as near as I'll ever get. Uh, so he just uh, he just thought Burton hung the moon. He very very fond of Burton, not because Burton always voted with him or agreed with him, but he just admired him as a man. He just thought he was the most. Uh, his character was so great and strong, and he's so moral, and, and he just a uh, great fan of his. Uh, <coughs> but he got along pretty well with everybody. He and Frankfurter had their ups and downs, as Frankfurter did with everybody. Right. Uh, that was part of his his uh, methodology, I think. But uh, but he he was Frankfurter. It was always Frankfurter came to our office more than any other justice. Uh, and uh, at one point, uh, and he and he loved to fight verbally. Uh, and particularly with Kozol, who was from Harvard. I always kind of stayed shy of him. And of course, whenever the justice would come in, he'd come in our office. The Reed's office was on a corner. And uh, you couldn't get into his office directly. You either had to go through the secretary's office or the clerk's office. <coughs> so Frankfurter would come through our office. And of course, we'd jump up and, and bow and scrape. And uh, so he'd. Uh, have some case he wanted to talk about or something. He, he was nothing much for small talk, but he was coming. I'm coming to see Stanley about such and such, and what do you all think about this, and what do you all think about it? Well, Kozol was a Harvard graduate, and so I guess he felt I wasn't up to his standards, but uh, <coughs> it suited me fine. But he and Kozol would really get into it. I mean, uh, Kozol would just uh, say, I don't agree with you, Mr. Justice. It's blah, blah, blah. No, what do you mean? And at one point, one time, <coughs> Frankfurter picked up a book, a law book, case book, and threw it at Kozol. <laughs> Literally threw it across the room at him. <laughs> he was something else. But th their relationship went up and down, I think, over the years. Uh, it was pretty close. Uh, when I was there in 54, 55, they were, uh, at least they weren't fighting each other. Reed never fought anybody. Yeah. Uh, Frankfurter fought everybody. But, uh, but they, were, they were friends. <coughs> he got along well with the Chief Justice, <coughs> at least in those early days. As time went on, I think they drifted apart because of their philosophy. But, uh, uh, but uh, Clark and, and Minton, uh, who were by the way, happened to be on either side of him uh, in their offices. He was never close to Douglas particularly, and, and Douglas was never close to anybody. Uh, he was very friendly with Black. Uh, uh, I'm sure he was friendly with Jackson, 
when he was there, and he certainly was with Harlan when he came. Brown versus Board. You, your timing in on the court was such that the Brown versus Board one had been decided. Correct. Uh, was there much discussion in the chambers about what had just had occurred? Uh, no, uh, not not in our chambers. Uh, uh, Reed had had a very difficult time, I think, the year before uh, with Fassett and his other clerk, George Mickham, and particularly since I understood it, this didn't come out in so much in Fassett's book as, as it did orally, and maybe he doesn't want it to come out, I don't know. Mickham is now deceased. Uh, but uh, uh, he was a very conservative uh, young man uh, and, uh, and, a, and a very staunch Catholic. Uh, and I use those terms advisedly together, meaning a conservative Catholic. And uh, he was very much opposed to the Brown decision uh, and kept feeding the justice all the facts of why the justice ought to be opposed to it. Fassett, on the other hand, was much more liberal and much more in favor of the opinion. And particularly, it got down to not so much how the justice would the, his vote wouldn't mean anything. It became clear, mm -hmm. even in those days, that the majority was going to vote in favor of the Brown decision, uh, outlawing segregation. But uh, uh, it was a question whether he was going to dissent or not. And Mickham thought he should, and Fassett thought he shouldn't. Uh, so that was the but that was the year before. Mm -hmm. So by that time, the Rubicon had been crossed as far as Reed was concerned. And Do you get a sense as to, did you ever hear from anybody as to when Reed sort of decided he would just become uh, part of the unanimous court? Uh, I, only uh, in regard to Fassett, uh, that it, it was in, uh, oh, I'd say uh, some months prior to the decision. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it wasn't right before the decision or anything. I think he could see the handwriting. I think Jackson's death had a lot to do with it. I think he thought Jackson would dissent, or at least in a, a concur or join him in a dissent. Uh, and I think he felt Clark might, and I think he then saw Clark not going that way. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, and then of course the Chief Justice, uh, no question about it, that. He put the heat to him uh, in a lovely, nice way. And uh, of course, Frankfurter put it to him too, but not in a lovely, nice way always. Mm -hmm. But the Chief Justice was very diplomatic. And actually, Frankfurter sort of laid off and let the Chief do the, all the, mm -hmm. the electioneering. So uh, I would say it was three or four months. I don't know that anyone knows the exact time, but. Uh, uh, certainly, uh, there was no conversation during my year about the initial uh, decision, except uh, that the justice was as worried about the, the, the Brown II, the mandate, the decree. And that was part of his main worry in Brown I. It wasn't the fact that he felt that, oh, he, uh, he felt it shouldn't have been equal protection, it ought to have been due process. There were legal arguments. but. Uh, but but he was not opposed to to uh, uh, desegregation in the schools. I mean, he uh, but he was opposed to how it was done and when it was done. Mm -hmm. And of course, that was the exact issue focused on in in Brown too, is when. And uh, so there was a great deal of conversation about that. And he uh, but there was a great deal of conversation about that even back. In uh, according to Fassett, and in the Fassett book, even back when Brown one was being considered, it was not so. I mean, he never came out and said, "I just think it's terrible to do this and strike down Plessy and all." He never took that position. It was more that now's not the time to do it. If we do it, we're going to have insurrection. If we do it, we're going to do this. And we, he was terribly, terribly worried about the effect of the decision, much more so than the decision itself. And of course, that's what we spent most of our year 
wrestling with. And I was one of the five or six. Prettyman was on the same, Barrett Prettyman was on the same group. The Chief Justice uh, appointed six of us, or asked six of us, to spend the summer working on every possible facet of school desegregation or integration in the United States over the last umpteen years, uh, particularly in the border states, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio. And uh, we then divided up the work. I've forgotten whether, uh, whether uh, Earl Pollock was on that group or not, but uh, I, I know Prettyman was, and I, I can't even remember who the others were, but uh, it seems to me Jones, a fellow named Jones, who was Justice Clark's clerk, was oh, one of them. Anyway, there were six of us. And we went to the Library of Congress. We went to, the, uh, of course, the Supreme Court Library. By that time, the Ford Foundation had funded a great study, and they published a newspaper. I call it a newspaper. It was a periodical, but it was in the form of a newspaper in collecting the very things we were looking, at, looking for. And so we used it as a major, major uh, element of our, uh, of our work. But we divided the country up and the facets up into uh, segments. I remember I had Illinois, Southern Illinois, uh, and particularly Cairo, Illinois. Uh, they'd had terrible troubles there. And that was one of my cities to zero in on, read the newspapers, uh, read everything I could about it. And then we put that all together. And then we had, uh, uh, it was all in a compendium. And then we had a meeting or two uh, to come up with our conclusions, which is what, what, the chief, what the Chief Justice, what the Chief Justice wanted uh, were our conclusions as well as, you know, <laughs> they were not going to carry the day, but they'd be helpful. So we had, uh, we had sessions in which we took, uh, the question was, uh, what should the decree say? How should we do this? How should we enforce this? So then we, we you know, immediately uh, uh, set guidelines, uh, uh, have uh, marshals go in and, you know, all types of possibilities. Uh, based upon what had been the historic uh, facts in other cities that had had the similar problems, even when they did, they weren't under court order to do it. So uh, we we met, and uh, I, I had kind of forgotten that there was as much split as there was. Apparently, uh, I read a book. Uh, I guess it's in Simple Justice, a wonderful book. There's a split of. Uh, four were for this and two were for that, and I, I couldn't tell you today who, what I was for and what I wasn't for. But anyway, we turned all that in. <coughs> I'm was all, it a report? Yes, it's yeah. It yeah. no, it, it was a <laughs> document. It was a stack of things. I mean, it were volumes of reports. In other words, my, I had my section and somebody else had their section, and then we'd put them together, and, and so, I mean, it was a huge amount of, uh, of compilation. We didn't cut out every newspaper article, but, but we thought the ones that were important. There would have been an executive summary. That's correct. And that was what we were working on, because that's really what he'd asked us to do. So there was a, there was a, a summary and the points, and in other words, the six clerks feel that boom, 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 boom. This is it, who it, gave you the questions? Did Chief Justice Warren give uh, No, his, his was just an overall question okay. of what should the decree say? Uh, how should we do this? That was the charge. Right. And then we broke it up into possibilities of how the decree might work. It, it could be just a, a strict order. It should, could be a per curiam decision. It could be uh, keeping jurisdiction. Uh, you know, there are all types of things it could be. So that was, that was the, the thing I'm not sure, I'm sure he didn't read all that other stuff or neither did read. But then that, that was delivered to all, all, that was replicated and delivered to all the justices. All nine had it. Did, did any of the, to me it's a cu really a curious piece of uh, Supreme Court history where in fact you have a chief justice in essence asking clerks to go outside the record. Correct. 
course, he went outside the record in, Bra in, in Brown. Uh, I mean, the Meridol comment and the other uh, fellow who just died, uh, forgot Clark, yeah. Clark, yeah. Uh, and there was a great criticism uh, about that, as you well know. Uh, but uh, no, th this was strictly. I a, assume this was. I mean, I, I, see, this really didn't have anything to do with the law or really the record. It had to do. That was over, and right. the, the decision was made. Now we've said this is it. Yeah. So what do we do? In effect, what do we do now? You know, we, it's like the dog chasing the ambulance. You know, it get the hold of the tire. Now what do I do? You know, uh, and uh, so it, that's kind of the way it was. I mean, they they had a tiger by the tail, and and he needed all the help. Uh, the court thought they needed all the help they could get. Uh, so naturally, turning over to the, to, but but the important thing was that we were the. To to give the the backup, not just to give, uh, you know, sit in a room and say, well, I think we ought to do this. But what really happened in Cairo? Why why did they use police to do this or didn't use police? So there was all of this in there, and I don't know where. Oh, I'm sure I know where it is. It's up in the Supreme Court Library or in a storage somewhere. But I, I've often wondered why that document has never been, and maybe it has been, maybe maybe some of the, maybe uh, in uh, uh, Simple Justice, maybe uh, he, he had mm -hmm. access to it, I don't know. But it's a very valuable piece of information because it, it really is a compendium of everything in this country that had to do with desegregation of public schools. I mean, everywhere, yeah. California, New York, uh, Washington, Louisville, Louisville, you know, d desegregated before uh, they got the order, uh, was uh, one of several cities who did. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and of course Cairo did. Uh, so, it's, it's gathering dust somewhere. Was any of the nine justices at all concerned that they were getting this extra information? Was there any, did you get any sense that they were wondering why Chief Justice Warren actually had requested this? No, actually it started with Reed, uh, with Warren, uh, even back before the first decision, because it gets back to Reed's point. Reed's point was, okay, let's assume we got to overrule Plessy. Let's assume uh, that it, it does violate, uh, it is unconstitutional. Uh, uh, now what do we do? I mean, that was always his, he always kind of jumped the hurdle. Uh, I think he was more for dissenting in Brown, saying this is a wrong time to make this decision. Mm -hmm. uh, but at any rate, uh, the decision having been made, he, uh, he started collecting this material when Facet was still there. In other words, Facet was charged by Reed to get all of the information he possibly could on desegregation uh, that was then available. Well, of course, Fassett was doing certs, he was doing opinions, he was, you know, he, he had a lot to do, so he couldn't really go into it like six guys could. Mm -hmm. So, but he did go into it. And then I think it's, this is in his book, and I think it's also in Simple Justice. He, uh, right before he left, Reed wrote him and said, I think he did, uh, I'm sure he did, he said, why don't you take this down to the chief and show him what we got and what we ought to really look at. So this idea of so-called going out of the record, outside the record, uh, was nothing new. I mean, that, that, I don't think they considered that going outside the record. So uh, he did, Fassett did. Reed wasn't there. Fassett took it down. And Warren apparently looked at it for a couple of days and then came back and said, I'm going to have six law clerks spend their summer increasing this research. So it really came from, from as I gather it, it came from Reed. And, and, and the, uh, the other thing that's so interesting about it is the guy who was most interested in it was Felix Frankfurter once it was started. And of course, he, he went outside all the time to get, like, uh, Bikel and uh, these other professors to write memos on various things. So he was very interested there. And of course, he stayed in Washington. He didn't go away in the summer, 
all, nearly all the rest of them did, certainly Reed did. So he was always there, yeah, how you boys doing, you know? <laughs> well, we're still working at it, Mr. Justice. Uh, well, you found anything? You know, he, he was, he, he, he was he, of course, he meddled in everything. He, but he was very, he, he thought it was a very good idea. They all did. Did the churches bring, let me back up. During Brown one, it was clear that the clerks were pretty well muzzled and kept out of the deliberations. Mm -hmm. uh, a few exceptions, but only a right. few. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, was that the case in Brown II? Uh, not as much, uh, but uh, in fact, not as much at all. Uh, you know, some of these books talk about the fact that the clerk says, you know, have a private dining room. Mm -hmm. For good reason. <laughs> if they were in a public dining room, <laughs> every newspaper man in the world would know everything that's going on. Because uh, we did spend that lunch hour sharing information, uh, you know, talking about the ball games too. But uh, in other words, that was a great. Uh, uh, I don't remember Reed ever saying this, but he certainly would, would, would welcome any information. Did you say, you know, at lunch today, Justice Clark's clerk said so-and-so. Well, you know, he, oh, he did? So, I mean, it was a, a sort of a double clearing ground. Of course, the justices generally ate together, too, mm -hmm. or frequently did. Uh, but now here, all the clerks are eating together. And, of course, they spend their time uh, mostly talking about what's going on in their office or what how they feel about these cases, and they're arguing the cases and everything. It was wonderful. We also had a guest that we could invite anybody. We had uh, Dean Acheson, we had uh, Nixon, we had uh, Tom Clark, we had uh, uh, anybody we asked. Would, it felt like they had to come, you see. Uh, so we had just the cream of the crowd. What newspaper people? Uh, would come and have lunch with us in the private dining room. No holes barred, nobody present. Ask them any question you want. And, uh, and they would answer them. So uh, uh, that, was, that was great. So there was a great deal of conversation mm -hmm. during Brown uh, 1. Brown 1 wasn't you know, a great secret. Uh, it, it was, everybody knew kind of what it got, had to do. It had to order something. So it's just a question of what and where and why. So, no, the secrecy was not, not nearly as, uh, as as bad. And of course, uh, they pretty much had the, they pretty much had the opinion. Uh, I think I don't know. Of course, Warren wrote it, or his office wrote it. Uh, pretty much was done before uh, <laughs> they even heard the arguments from the states. <laughs> uh, but uh, I don't know that that's true, but I think it's pretty much true. We'll ask Earl Pollock to see. Yeah. The term with all deliberate speed, which yeah. is repeated over and over yeah. again, yeah. And oxymoron. Was that a conversation prior to? No, no. The, the, wording, the wording was never, to my way, discussed. I, I, you know, the justice saw it. I don't know that we even, even saw it before it was delivered the final draft. I mean, we kind of knew what I was going to say, but we, we didn't know. Uh, you, you know the story of that, which is in all these books, uh, uh, where that phrase comes from? Tell it for the tape. <laughs> well, uh, we always thought that, that uh, either Pollock or Gunther invented it, but <laughs> scratch them, they don't get any credit at all. Uh, Felix Frankfurter suggested it because Oliver Wendell Holmes had used it in many cases involving equity. It, 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 he used it as an equitable maxim. Uh, Holmes did. Now, Frankfurt or somebody did a lot of research. Well, I think this uh, guy wrote uh, Simple Justice. Did. They did a lot of research. They couldn't find it anywhere in the old English or anything. But what they did find was a poem called Hounds of Heaven written by a Catholic uh, scholar uh, in which he had used the term deliberate speed. It wasn't with all deliberate speed, but with deliberate speed. Uh, and so uh, the writer uh, seems to think that Holmes stumbled onto this phrase from the poem. Mm -hmm. And then he used it, uh, Holmes doesn't say this, but 
this is the assumption, and then Frankfurter got it from Holmes, and then he, Frankfurter, urged the chief to use it. So that's the, the origin of it, which is right interesting. I love the phrase myself. <laughs> it got a lot of criticism, as you know. A lot of people didn't like it. I don't mean they didn't like the words, they didn't like the idea that they, they didn't set a time limit, they didn't set guidelines, they didn't do a lot of things that they should have done, according to some people. My own feeling was at the moment in history they did the right thing. I'm a big believer that, that uh, Brown II was about as diplomatically and artistically done as you can do something that difficult. Now, it hasn't worked out. <laughs> as they hoped it would, I think we all felt, the clerks, the justices, we all felt that there would be more rally around the flag boys and let's make this thing work uh, and put the heat on the South to do it. A lot of Southern states complied very rapidly. Uh, so it wasn't that, but a lot of them didn't. Uh, and so it, 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 it didn't, it didn't get the support from the public that we'd hoped. You listened to some of the arguments uh, during Brown II, and you, was, was that I a listen, draw? I listened you, to you, all of them. <laughs> you, you knew it was coming, obviously. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. And that was sort of a marquee event, I imagine. Yeah, and, and I would say most of the clerks did. I don't know that. I don't recall who, you know, we had a little box over the side, not, not roped off or anything, but where we usually came in from the back, and you could sit there uh, and walk in and out and not disturb anybody. So I heard nearly all the arguments by the states uh, uh, and there was that one, I can't find any support for my recollection, but I remember I came home and told my wife, uh, she may be my only corroborating witness, but uh, uh, it was toward the evening, uh, I mean like 3.30, 4 o'clock, it was, uh, Thurgood Marshall was making his final speech and uh, Lindsay Allman, who was the Attorney General of Virginia uh, at that time, later governor, <laughs> which astounds me, but uh, he looked the part, he, he looked like he came from central casting. But anyway, he made this, as, as several of the Virginia lawyers did, uh, of the fact they shouldn't have this, the integration or the desegregation because not only were the blacks not up to speed intellectually, they had more disease, they had more crime, uh, they shouldn't be mixed in, particularly with the disease, and he, he made an issue of venereal disease tuberculosis and so forth, uh, which I just turned my stomach. I thought, buddy, you'd have to, you're really scraping the bottom of the barrel here to make that argument. Well, anyway, he made it, so and then Thurgood Marshall gets his turn at bat, and uh, he stood uh, up in his swallowtail coat. Of course, he was a handsome man, and he just stood for a few minutes, not long. It seemed long, but it wasn't long. And he said, uh, you know, he said, it's amazing to me that the black people of the state of Virginia would make the argument they made when the black people of Virginia with those syphilitic hands, those venereal diseases, raised five presidents of the United States. <laughs> well, I mean, I, uh, I mean, it was, it was the most dramatic thing. He, he just, uh, and it, well, he went on to say how many generations of Virginians that these, these, these sick people uh, waited on and fed their children and nursed their children and put their children to bed and they're the same sick ones uh, that they can't go to school with. Uh, you know, knockout argument. Oh my gosh! Very dramatic, very dramatic. But I can't understand why no one else ever picked that up. That that that, that to me was, uh, in a sense, the high point of the arguments.
because he really knocked them dead. During the arguments, was there much questioning by the justices? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It varied. Uh, if they had a real good, uh, good uh, attorney general or representative uh, who was getting into some heavy, heavy ground, uh, they they go go pretty strong with him. Others, they kind of just, you know, hey, okay, yeah, sit down. He's just saying, he's being repetitive. Okay. Uh, they didn't say that, but he was they just being repetitive. And, but uh, no, they got into it uh, pretty good, particularly Chief Justice. He, he went after him, uh, and so did Frankfurter, and they all did. Was there, I don't think I read anything about this, was there a sense that uh, there was a lot of negotiations after the argument until the decision regarding the whole concept of unanimity? On two? Uh, on two, yes. No. Uh, not to nearly, apparently, the degree there was on one. Uh, uh, no, I, I think it went pretty well. Uh, at least from our office it did. Uh, Reed had no problem with signing on to it. I mean, he, he, he still, <laughs> he faced the whole thing with fear and trepidation. Mm -hmm. uh, but he felt that the wisdom of, uh, of Warren uh, in, in taking it, the gradualist approach, was the right one. And uh, it's uh, that once, once he got that point across, Frankfurter the same way. Frankfurter wanted the same graduate. Once, once they achieved that, then uh, they, they fell in line pretty easily. I don't recall that there was any, I mean, there wasn't the office back and forth and right. visiting that uh, occurred in a lot of cases. Uh, they, they, they were all pretty well agreed to it. And some took much more active part than others, of course. We're here to talk about Brown, too. Were there any other cases during the term? You know, we lose track of the fact that you guys went through <laughs> hundreds of cases, and yet that's the one that's focused in on. Was there any uh, other sort of highlight cases that you would remember? Uh, not, uh, not that I can, I'm sure there were. There was a case involving a Yale professor in the communist business. Uh, I can't even remember the name of it, uh, but uh, that term didn't produce any blockbusters other than the, uh, that to my recollection, uh, I'm sure <laughs> if you were a party to one of the suits you'd think it was a pretty important case. And uh, you know, we, we, the justice threw us a bone by letting us uh, take a first draft at some opinions. Uh, this idea that the clerks write the opinions is baloney. Uh, the most they ever do is draft something. Uh, but in Reed's case, we, we, we got very little drafting. Reed wrote nearly all of his opinions by hand on a yellow pad and then had them typed and went over them from there. And then he'd give them to us for us to go over and sort of proofread them and correct them. But uh, he, he gave me a couple and Kozol a couple to give our, so we can say that we had had a hand in writing, a, uh, but they weren't major cases, they're, not, they're nothing worth reporting. I mean, they were reported, but they weren't, they weren't uh, earth-shaking. Did you stay in touch with Reed after you'd left? Oh yes, we had a dinner every year. Uh, all the clerks, uh, we had a dinner for him uh, every year. We were the only group that did that. Now, the, the others had dinners, but not annually. No, we, we had a dinner for him every year in Washington, just the, just the clerks and the justice. Uh, and we had a picture taken every year uh, until he got so it was difficult for him to do that. I mean, he his, his last few years were not good uh, mentally. He, uh, I guess we, I don't know, you'd call it Alzheimer's or hardening the arteries or whatever, but he, he sort of lost it. Right. Uh, but I'd say we had the dinners, well, we had the dinners all the way through his active uh, time on the court. I would say we slacked off after, the, after he resigned. Maybe had one or two, but. No, we, we got together every year. 
If Stanley Reed were here today, what would he think the legacy of Brown versus Board 1 and 2 has been? <laughs> Uh, he would say, I told you so. Uh, I think uh, because a lot of what he predicted did come true. But uh, I think he would, well, I know that he would be, he would not want to take his vote back. In other words, he is completely satisfied, or was completely satisfied, that he made the right decision for the good of the United States government and and the people and the school children. Uh, but I think he would, <clears throat> he would say, I predicted it would take a long time. This has been just What question have I asked him? What should I have asked him? <laughs> what am I missing here? <laughs> <laughs> I, know you uh, water it, I think we've, at three, let's see, what I charge now, 375 or 400 an hour. That's right, yeah, we got a good yeah. hour out of him right there. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure the center can afford much it's, more of me. <laughs> no. it's, it's been terrific. great fun. I've enjoyed it. Well, I've enjoyed the opportunity to, I live in the past most of the time now anyway. I'm a great nostalgia freak. Mm -hmm. Well, you can't really understand where you are if you don't know, understand where you come from. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. That's and, true. And you find that more and more. And, and again, this whole 50-year cycle it sounds weird, but yeah. what, what I'm with Jackson, because he died in 54, so it, literally 50 years ago. Yeah. So stuff you learn about him, and all of a sudden you start reading about over and over that's again. Right. Uh, recycled. That's much about Jackson, but the issues. Yeah. It's a yeah. Funny, funny... Well, and in your case particularly, I mean, you're hearing a lot of these <coughs> stories over and over, maybe from a different angle or from a different point of view or something. Well, of course, the, the Brown cases have been worked over a great deal. Right. <laughs> but there's always something new, and, and uh, you're right in, in saying that the, uh, the fortunate young men who were the law clerks, there were no young women, unfortunately, in those days, uh, or late, uh, not my year. They came later. I don't think there were any women. Uh, until maybe two or three years from my time. Uh, and now they're about half women. But um, there were things that, for instance, some of your people that are coming, Earl Pollock, that Barrett Prettyman, to a lesser degree me, uh, some that aren't going to, uh, they know stuff that nobody else knows. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, even though it's been worked over and worked over and worked over. Uh, I mean, I don't think anybody, to use another example, that anybody ever told you that Stanley Reed thought Harold Burton was the second coming of Christ. <laughs> no, no. And you know, you, you guys are a source of knowledge, and there is a source of that information. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, Brown versus Board 2 has not been worked over. Mm -hmm. It's a case which has been virtually not written about. It's a postscript. That's true. Uh, I will say this, though, uh, and, and this, I hope, comes out tomorrow. I would really urge anyone who is interested enough to get the new edition of Simple Justice to read the, the new chapter he wrote, which is the 50-year chapter. In other words, what has happened he is the regular book that takes you to the end and the decree etc and then he's got another chapter which is the last chapter in the book that says okay now 50 years looking back where are we what's happened it's really one of the most marvelous uh, pieces of writing I don't mean from the skill necessarily of his writing which is very good but uh, the intellect of it, the, the, the meat of it is, is so, uh, I was telling my wife at breakfast, I said, I guess the reason I liked it so much was because I agreed with him, <laughs> or he agreed with me one, uh, on so much of it. But unfortunately, it doesn't leave, it doesn't have a happy ending. I mean, it doesn't leave you with a feeling of, boy, Boy, what we've accomplished in 50 years. Now, we've accomplished a lot. And the, the important thing about Brown, in my opinion, the single most important thing is, 
it pulled the cork out of the bottle. It started us on finally doing something that we should have been doing all along. By we, I mean the American people and the government. It, it started us down the road of recognizing the problem and trying to help solve it. And that it did. And, and, uh, and if, if for no other reason, uh, if, it, if it wasn't as successful with the schools as you'd hoped it would have been, it was still very successful in starting us on the right road. I mean, but for Brown, you wouldn't have had the movements that we had. Uh, it, at the time we had it, now ultimately we may have had it, but I'm talking about we wouldn't have had it the last 50 years the way we've had the last 50 years. Uh, we wouldn't have had the Martin Luther Kings and the Rosa Parkses and the, uh, the people that, uh, it gave them the starch, uh, the moxie, if you will, to stand up and say, okay, now the Supreme Court said this and now we want some. So uh, it, it was a great service and it, no question it was one of the great decisions the court has ever made uh, and, the, and the correct decision. Uh, forgetting the fact that it involved one or two schools uh, and ultimately all the schools. Uh, forgetting, putting the schools aside, uh, it did wonders 